Hey guys, Dr. Dapplin in Board Certified Dermatologist. If you suffer from pigmentation, this video is for you. This is a high level discussion on the use of sunscreens pertaining to photo protection in the context of melasma and pigmentary disorders. This is very different compared to using sunscreens to prevent photo aging and sunburn. I'll tell you why. So for photo aging and sunburn, which I will not talk in this topic, is that you'll need high factor SPF sunscreen, preferably, especially if you're trying to prevent or reduce sunburn with an SPF factor of 50 and above. Photo aging is totally different as well. You need SPF 50, ideally because that reduces the amount of burning, but also a long wave UVA photo protection to decrease the amount of photo aging that you'll get from long wavelengths hitting into the deeper dermal layers. So today's video, I'll talk about sunscreens meant to reduce or prevent pigmentation and this is very very different so if you suffer from conditions like post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation melasma freckles or any of the other conditions whereby sun produces pigment for example when you're looking at drug induced pigment things like ashy dermatosis lichen planus pigmentosis and all those rare conditions whereby the sun can make your skin more discolored or dark this is the video for you now sunscreens can be categorized based upon the level of further protection that can be categorized as organic or inorganic. In the context of treating pigment, it is vitally important that you understand it's not just the UVB. The UVB only plays a small factor because when you look at the wavelengths, for example, when you look at melasma, you're looking at what's known as the action spectrum. The action spectrum ranges from UVB, easy to block out, UVA, short wave UVA, long wave UVA1, visible light, and all the way to infrared light, which is very, very hard to block. So if you suffer from pigment, the consensus is that you only need to have an SPF of 30, especially if you have skin of color. And once again, it's not to protect from the burning side of things because an SPF 30 can easily do that. It's the other nuances within the sunscreen that's super important. So we talk about UVB. It is very important to get something which also blocks long wave UVA1. Now, when you look at um, particles, for example, titanium dioxide, zinc oxide, it's only the pigmentary grade titanium dioxide that gives you that blockage from the long wave length UVA. So when you look at microfine particles, for example, microfine and nanoparticles of zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, they're more cosmetically elegant, which means when you put it on, there's less of that white sheen or hue, right? When that happens, the compliance increases. But if you use, for example, titanium dioxide in pigmentary grade, it's large particles, much larger than something like 100 nanometers. So the small particles give you good cosmesis, they give you good blockage of UV, B, but the, the tail actually drops off very quickly when you're looking at long wave UVA photo protection. For those, the big particles are great, but most people, probably 99% of people, won't use them because you just look totally white. So what the solution is, is what's known as hybrid sunscreen. So the hybrid sunscreens are the ones which contain chemicals, for example, uh, La Roche-Posay makes Enthelios. And that particular particle itself, or that particular uh, chemical sunscreen, can block the long wavelength UVA1, which is very important when it comes to treating pigment. So those sunscreens, you do need what's known as hybrid sunscreens, ideally. You can get away with um, sunscreens which contain, uh, are basically inorganic, which contains your zinc oxide, titanium and dioxide, but the cosmetic compliance is an issue. From there, we talk about blockage of UVB, easy to do, UVA1, hybrid sunscreens, and then the visible light. And this is where things get interesting because depending on the regulation, depending on which country you're at, you may not see something advertised as a sunscreen. Does this mean it's bad? No, it doesn't. Because a lot of these products contain the active chemicals or the active ingredients, which I've discussed prior, but because they're not heralded as a primary um, sunscreen, in other words, they're secondary, they can't use the word sunscreen and you don't have labeling depending on which country you're at. So when you're looking at, I guess, a product, if you look at something that has, contains an SPF or advertises SPF 40, right? You've got to read it as, does it block UVB? The answer is yes, because 40 is a um, factor of preventing sunburn. But also look at the ingredients to see whether they've got uh, chemicals which can block long wave UVA1. Importantly, with these sunscreens or these products, which are not sunscreens, but have further protective roles, they may have 
other components such as iron oxide, which is super important when it comes to treating pigment, because iron oxide basically attenuates the high energy visible, HEV, in other words, the blue light, anywhere from the 400, 405 nanometers all the way up to 450, 460 nanometers, which is very important when you're treating melasma. In fact, for melasma in different forms of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, the action spectrum of the wavelength even extends way beyond the 450, 470 nanometers right up to your infrared, which is very hard to block. So importantly, when you look at these inactive ingredients, they might not be labeled, but generally speaking, when you look at the tinted formulation, they contain iron oxides. Now, the optimal dose of iron oxide is very tricky because the formulations do not need to disclose the concentration. And there's no research showing which formulations are best so for example, the primary research has shown that uh, with a concentration of over 3%, somewhere around 3.2, 3.3%, the attenuation of visible light is all the way up to 90, 92%. Which means when you go down to 1%, for example, a lot of sunscreens that are commercially available, your HEV further protection, in other words, your protection against blue light is not quantifiable. So when you buy these sunscreens, you're taking a gamble that the iron oxide content is high enough to block or attenuate blue light in high energy visible, visible without being labeled on the actual package itself as to the concentration. So these are little nuances that I hope that over time with regulation that you have some kind of standardized uh, way of which you can read sunscreens. So to summarize, the reason why SPF is less important, not, not, not important at all, but less important when you're talking of skin of color and pigmentary disorders is because in the vast majority of cases, when it comes to hyperpigmentation, there's an overrepresentation in darker skin types. And for darker skin types, we know that melanin is photoprotective. In other words, we don't burn as easily. And hence, UVB is less of an issue compared to lighter skin types when you're looking at preventing burning. The last thing I'll talk about and touch on is that certainly all these ingredients and nuances about sunscreens are super important. But the most critical factor that 95% of people overlook is application amount and frequency. So you, amount, you need that two milligrams per centimeter squared of sunscreen, which equates to around half to three quarters of a teaspoon. Some people say up to one teaspoon, three to five mils application face and neck. Now three to five application or two finger lengths is a lot. It's a lot of sunscreen. Only when you use that amount do you get the advertised SPF. So for us, you might hear me in clinic advertise or uh, basically try to promote or endorse an SPF 50. And if you're in Japan or, or in Asian countries, an SPF 100. Does it really matter to me when I'm treating pigment? The answer is no. But what it really matters to me is that because people under apply, I'm using a high factor SPF to compensate for the fact that people, including myself, under apply sunscreen. So that's an important concept to remember. The other thing as well is reapplication, because as we know, throughout the day, your application um, amount does basically degrades over a period of anywhere between three to six hours. Quicker if you're playing sport and activity. So you do need to top out. Now guys, I hope you liked that video. It's more of a high level discussion in regards to photo protection. And this is the first thing you do before even thinking about your pigment correctors, active ingredients, various pico lasers, the pulse durations, the settings, and all those funky and really interesting stuff. So you gotta get to the nitty gritty of photo protection first if you suffer from pigmentary disorders. Otherwise, all those matters, all the active ingredients, all the thousands that you're spending on lasers will mean virtually zero.